The film opens with a title card noticing that 40,000 Germans went out on submarines in World War II, and that 30,000 never returned. In fall of 1941 the German Atlantic U-boat Armada is a simple 12 subs and the German lobby to control the North Atlantic is betraying them. Three officials of U-96 are driving down a dull street by the shores of La Rochelle, France. Enrolled mariners are tipsy and hanging out and about. They disturb the officials in a genuinely disagreeable manner, including peeing on their vehicle as it goes by. The officials, counting, as you before long find out, the commander, accept this. The following scene is in a rambunctious lager quarter. It is an honor meal for a sub-chief Thompson, Otto Sander, who just got a tribute, as well as a shipping off for U-96's team. Different scenes of lewdness work out. The officials are only a lot of boisterous children having a great time. U-96's commander, Jürgen Prochno, looks on smoothly. The commander is then acquainted with a party columnist, Lt. Werner, Herbert Grunemeyer, who will be going with them on their next visit to provide details regarding the significance of the Reich subgroups. They meet the skipper's main specialist and true second in order the boss, Klaus Wenmann, who is more established and clearly doesn't anticipate another visit. His better half is sick back home and he passes on to call about her. Thompson is brought out, looking extremely intoxicated and upheld by two officials. They note unfortunately that every one of the groups these days are simply children, and that the privileged few is practically gone. At the platform, Thompson gives a discourse brimming with what comes extremely near enemy of Nazi way of, several people in the crowd, conceivably SS men, look tense, yet finishes strong without saying anything too implicating, profanely commending their Fuhrer for his gallant position against Winston Churchill in England. Thompson is found in the men's room, considerably more intoxicated than previously and having regurgitated on the floor. The commander, Lt. Werner and the central report to U-96 in the shipyards of La Rochelle, France. The commander tends to his collected team and acquaints them with Werner. Of most note are the main lieutenant, Hubertus Bengsch, a snobby youthful no-nonsense Nazi, and the subsequent lieutenant, Martin Semmelrog, who is a smart prankster and continually ends up the primary lieutenant. Lt. Werner, the columnist, is directed to the lesser official's bunks where he figures out that even the officials need to share beds due to space imperatives. Lieutenant Werner is ribbed by explorer, Jan Fetter, another comedian, and gets to know an exceptionally youthful official, Allman, with a French sweetheart back home who he continually composes letters to. You likewise have your most memorable chance of Johan, the top of the motor room, a pale, bumbling individual whom the group individuals call the Phantom. The team experience the drudgery of ordinary drills. Lieutenant Werner snaps pictures of everything in sight at first, yet steadily quiets down. The group approaches their everyday business with expanding horridness, every one of them with the exception of the main lieutenant quit shaving and develop stubbles, and their moil is just broken by a phony problem organized by the commander to keep them honest. During this time you discover that the chief has no adoration for the Nazis, and assurance among the higher officials appears to be horrifying. The skipper at one point chooses to perceive how profound the sub can jump. As far as possible the protected zone down to just 170 meters, however the skipper, likely arousing a lot of embarrassment for the group, brings it down to very nearly 200. This causes unfavorable squeaking commotions to produce from the frame, and everybody is feeling significantly better when the skipper orders the sub back up. After more fatigue, the sub gets a transmission that an escort has been spotted. The team jumps at the chance to pursue them, yet the commander says they get no opportunity of arriving in time thus they return to the weariness of hanging tight for better news. Presently, they receive a message about an escort that they will actually want to block, and the chief kicks the sub into full stuff to get it. They approach the guard in exceptionally weighty haze, however before they might draw near to the point of seeing anything one of the escort destroyers spots them and the sub needs to jump. Subsequent to being profundity charged over and again by the destroyer however taking no genuine harm, the chief figures out how to lose them in departure. The chief notes that the English destroyers are getting more brilliant, and that they never again commit errors. The team is completely dispirited since they didn't actually draw near to sinking a boat and scarcely got away with their lives, yet at the same time stay in genuinely positive feelings. Lieutenant Warner sits in the weariness of the group. Around 50% of the group winds up with crabs. They haphazardly run into one of the other 11 subs in the Atlantic, which is a concise blissful recess, trailed by the chief being irritated at the terrible preparation and route that brought about one-sixth of the armada being in a similar spot inexplicably. 
Another transmission has gotten that there is a huge escort spotted and that few different subs are now joining on it. They choose to let it all out as well, and this time they approach the escort inconspicuous and fire a few torpedoes at two of the vessels, arrival direct hits. While they are sending off the torpedoes they spot a destroyer somewhere far off, however don't figure it will cause an issue. Nonetheless, in the wake of sending off the remainder of the torpedoes the skipper can't see the destroyer in the periscope any longer. At the point when he at last sees it, it is quickly coming straight for them. They jump rapidly and figure out how to move far sufficient away that the profundity charges cause no harm. They hear the torpedoes hit, and are very content until the main terrifying ping of the destroyer's ASDIC, English sonar, framework sounds. The sub stays there with the pings drawing nearer and stronger, the destroyer drawing closer, unfit to do much adjacent to trust it doesn't see them. It sees them, however, and begins profundity charging them like frantic. You see a fix of Johan wedged under a few hardware, grasping his head and watching went nuts and hopeless. The chief figures out how to sidestep the destroyer, just to have a subsequent destroyer come at them from an alternate course. Left with no decision, the chief orders them to plunge exceptionally profound, well into the red zone on their profundity measure. The water pressure makes bolts begin popping inwards, harming gear and injuring a crew member. Right now Johan, presently absolutely insane, staggers onto the extension jabbering unintelligibly. The chief orders him back to his post, however Johan simply sways towards him. The skipper moves away and ultimately different officials can get Johan out. As he twists himself down, the chief saves a gun he'd rapidly gotten to manage Johan's breakdown. At long last all indications of the destroyer's blur, and the sub stays submerged for six additional hours as a sanity check. It then, at that point, surfaces to find that one of the boats it destroyed was an oil big hauler, which is presently encircled by consuming oil however hasn't sunk. The chief orders one more torpedo terminated at it to follow through with the task. As this torpedo hits, the sub-team can see that there are still survivors on the big hauler. The commander is exasperated that in six hours nobody acted the hero them. The survivors swim towards the sub, yet the skipper unfortunately orders them to move away. The group who witnessed this, especially Lieutenant Werner, are exceptionally troubled. Running really short on provisions and fuel, the team expects that they are currently to dock at La Rochelle, France. Rather they are provided troubling requests, they are to subtly moor with a covert German stock boat at Vigo, an impartial Spanish port. Another highly classified dispatch is gotten and decoded, U-96 won't get back to La Rochelle yet rather make the intersection of the English-controlled Straits of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean to arrive at the Italian waterfront town of La Spezia. The commander realizes that this is basically a self-destruction mission since the Strait of Gibraltar is quite possibly of the most vigorously guarded United Maritime Zone on the planet, and he sets up for Lieutenant Werner and the boss, whose spouse is extremely sick, to leave the sub at the Spanish port and advance back to Germany. Lieutenant Werner would rather not go, yet the skipper demands that he's as of now been in an excess of peril. Werner consents to take the lesser official's adoration letters, there are many them, to his French sweetheart. Johan comes to the commander and apologizes for leaving his post, demanding that it will not repeat and asking the chief to not court military him. The skipper is reluctant, however ultimately acknowledges Johan's expression of remorse and sends him off. They come to Vigo and the mystery supply transport, the Wesser, ends up being fabulously very much selected. The officials get on and are dealt with like legends by the groveling group. The officials are dreary and don't warmly embrace the regal treatment. They are significantly more irritated by the boat's group imploring them to recount their thrilling stories. The chief's face and voice become spooky when he discusses their most recent run and almost being annihilated during the weighty profundity charging they got. Amidst the impermanent rest the chief gets a message from Central Command. Leave for Lieutenant Werner and the boss has been denied. They need to remain with the boat until the end. The boss is noticeably disturbed, however says that it's great since his substitution would be some bumbling youngster. Lieutenant Werner is clashed, yet certainly miserable about giving the lesser official back his affection letters. The boat is resupplied and they go on their way. The sub prevents away from the Straits of Gibraltar to consider things. They can see an armada of English warships watching the thin hole between the precipices. The chief, for absence of a superior thought, concludes that they will make a quiet run towards the hole, then plunge profound without a second to spare and trust that the tide can assist them with floating under the faux armada. Nobody, including the skipper himself, appears to take a lot of confidence in this arrangement. 
At the point when all is good and well, they start their run towards the straits. Tragically, taking into account Propel's and partnered maritime radar innovation, they are quickly detected. An English military aircraft promptly starts barraging the sub and delivering an immediate hit with a bomb. Shots from the boat start detonating around them. The skipper and pilot, who is gravely shot up, head once again into the sub, which quickly begins plunging. Tragically, because of the harm from the bomb the sub can't haul out of the jump. It goes further and more profound, beyond the point that the bolts begin extinguishing once more and terrible commotions come from the frame. The tension makes a few lines burst and portions of the sub begin flooding. The sub ultimately comes to a lay on a stone at around 280 meters down, past the constraint of the profundity measure. The sub is flooding gravely and its motors aren't working. In the interim, the guide is draining to death and the specialist is frantically attempting to keep him alive. The group madly starts to fix up the harm and prevent the water from flooding the whole sub. In the midst of the mayhem of individuals frantically sticking anything they can into the holes, Johann chivalrously jumps into a profound flood puddle to find and stick the wellspring of a significant break. The main shimmies under floorboards to supplant a lot of harmed batteries, conquering the poisonous vapor made by the spilled sulfuric acid. As the brakes stop and the shot guide balances out, the skipper and the boss survey what is going on. There is a lot of harm to fix, and all the water should be rescued, and in the event that all goes impeccably they could have a single shot at surfacing. They are likewise short on oxygen and have to do everything rapidly so they don't run out. The team approaches bailing the enormous measure of water, kin detachment style, into the bilge where it will be extinguished when they attempt to surface. The main proceeds with his fixes. Nighttime the water is completely bailed and the group is totally depleted from the work. Oxygen is basically low. The skipper orders all men not on prompt obligation to go to their bunks and unwind, while the central proceeds with his fixes. In their bunks, the dozing men wear little breathing devices to save air. The group is undeniably imploded about the sub, oxygen denied and surrendered to death. Indeed, even the skipper gives up and faults his own carelessness for the group's destiny. The main completions fixes, notwithstanding, and accepts that they actually get an opportunity. The commander and the main purpose to check it out. They blow their weight and gradually begin rising. Johan fires the motors and, incredibly, they start and work. They surface and everybody takes happy much needed refreshers. On top of the perception tower, the skipper shouts blissfully that they can escape since the Brits assumed they were all dead. The sub limps back to La Rochelle. Droves of individuals are on a mission to welcome them, and the drained sailors get a legends gladly received. They seem worse for were yet glad that they made it. Out of nowhere, an airstrike alarm sounds. Faux warplanes dive in, gunning and bombarding everybody and everything in sight, including U-96. Lieutenant Werner and the boss figure out how to make it into a safe house alongside a couple of the subs group. After the planes depart Lieutenant Werner goes out to review the harm. The greater part of the team is dead. The bodies of Johan, the subsequent lieutenant, Ullman, and others lay on the dock. At last Werner comes to the chief, who is as yet standing. Yet, a stream of blood streams from his mouth and he gradually falls. Werner looks on, frightened. The chief lives sufficiently lengthy to see U-96 sink from sight. The camera zooms out of the scene, with Werner holding the dead commander.